Okay, folks, we will be getting started in three, count them, three minutes. Welcome, all of you who are here already. If you have questions already, hi, Anthony, um, hi, Ari, put them down at the bottom center. There's a red button where you ask a question. That is the only way that I will um, know that you have a question and the only way that I'll be able to invite you on screen with me to talk through whatever your question is. So bottom center is where you ask those questions. Hi, Moiska. Welcome. You can ask questions about anything. I'm only qualified to answer questions about positioning, though. <laughs> Welcome, Karen. Welcome, Adam. Hi, Ryan. <clears throat> okay. Uh, ever the uh, the polite uh, Southerner? I was raised <laughs> in the South. I'm upvoting everybody's question. You all get an upvote from me. Hi, Simon. Okay, we're T minus one minute. I want to allow time for uh, lots of questions, if there are any. And uh, so what I'm going to do is turn off my video camera and switch over to sharing my screen, uh, which will let you see the slide presentation for today. And then at the top of the hour, I am just going to get into it. Okay, it's 2 p.m. where I am, so let's let's do this. Uh, hello and welcome to this uh, first Micronar of 2016. The subject is positioning for professional services in one picture. A couple notes about uh, this whole idea of a Micronar. The idea is we'll I'll present 15 minutes of content and then that will leave us 45 minutes for open-ended uh, questions and discussion. Please feel free to stay as long as you like and leave whenever you need to. I am using uh, Crowdcast and the reason I'm using Crowdcast for this is because it allows uh, full peer-to-peer -peer interaction around questions. So anyone who's asked a question in that bottom question box, um, first of all, I know that you have a question, which is good. And then second, I can and I can and will click the little button that says invite you on screen. You don't have to respond to that invitation, but if you do, your video camera is going to turn on, your microphone is going to turn on, and you'll be live in the video stream with me so that we can go back and forth around whatever your question is. And I think that's going to be, uh, for me, for sure, it's going to be a lot more interesting than just a ask, answering a text question. And I think for you, it's going to be a lot more valuable to be able to have that back and forth. So... That's why I'm using Crowdcast. There will be a recording of this event later. Same URL you're on right now. Just come back and instead of a live event, you'll see the recorded version. And uh, I have no desire to try to trick you into staying the whole time with some kind of open loop or special offer or incentive for staying. Hopefully the information will be valuable enough that um, it's worth, worth your time. And if at any point you decide it's not, feel free to bail. Uh, but I hope you get a lot out of this. Uh, the 
really, honestly, the only reason I do a live event like this is for the Q&A. If, uh, if I wanted to just give the world's most polished presentation on positioning in 15 minutes, I would just record myself speaking into a webcam and put it up on YouTube and, and be done with it. To me, the real value is getting to talk with you and hear your questions and do my best to respond to them. So you can chat with other folks who are here on the right of the screen, but questions for me should go on the bottom because that's where Crowdcast has baked in all their uh, functionality around as asking questions. Please note that you can vote questions up. And uh, again, when I get to your question, I'll invite you on, on, on screen to discuss it real time with me. So with those uh, quick notes out of the way, I'm starting, uh, you can't see this, but I'm starting a 15 minute timer on my iPhone. And uh, I'm gonna spend the next 15 minutes trying to distill down for you the essence of what positioning is for professional services. So the theory of positioning is very interesting. There's books written about it that you can read and it's super interesting stuff, but I think what's much more interesting than the theory is how it works when it's applied. And when it's applied to a professional services business, positioning looks kind of like what you see here in this one picture. So in the green circle on the right, there's that sort of represents the stuff that you can or could do that clients might pay for. And that's a lot of stuff. On the left is this orange circle or yellow circle rather that represents the things that clients need, what, what they're willing to pay for or otherwise uh, give up resources to acquire. And this, there's a smaller subset of things that they'll pay top dollar for because they're critical to their business or they deliver a dramatic return on investment, or for some reason, the client values those things very highly. And so what I find is that if you can narrow down your marketing focus to that overlap of all three of those circles, really, the stuff you can do, the stuff clients need, and then more specifically, the stuff they really need, then you have found your ideal market position and you have positioned yourself in a way that's ideal for your business. So there's a lot more we could say about positioning, and I will uh, spend the next 13 minutes talking about uh, a few notes that support this idea. But that's really the big idea with positioning, is that you are trying to find that location where clients value your services the most, and you're positioning yourself to match that, uh, that need and that willingness of the clients to pay top dollar. One of the concerns that comes up a lot, it's come up for me myself, it's come up for other people, is that big green circle contains a lot of stuff that you like doing and you get a lot of enjoyment out of. And it's, you know, personally satisfying, it's rewarding for some reason, but it falls outside of the area of what your clients need. And it certainly falls outside the area of what they'll pay top dollar for. So my, my sort of uh, promise to you is even if you narrow your focus to that red circle that coincides with, what, with something you can do that clients will pay top dollar for, you still get to do other fun stuff, which is represented by those, uh, those purple circles. I promise you, <laughs> you'll still get to do those things even if you narrow your marketing focus in the way that I'm suggesting here. And that's not even to mention the fact that uh, just being self-employed and running a business is just interesting anyway. It involves all kinds of supporting activities and, uh, you know, sort of secondary things that you could do that are, um, you know, just a part of the, the process of being self-employed. And that's not even in this picture. I'm just talking about things that you would sell your clients here. Here's the thing, though, uh, people get kind of distracted by those other those purple circles and they have a lot of trouble narrowing down to just that one area that their that their clients will pay top dollar for. And the reason for that, I believe, and I think this is backed up by the experience I've had working one on one with people. The reason is because they see their their business as an extension of their personal identity and they see their personal identity as an extension of their skills and their interests and their sense of self, which is fine, that's quite normal. 
But when you start to think of your business as an extension of yourself, you start to get really sort of wrapped up in all those purple circles. And it becomes hard to let any of them go enough to, to narrow down your marketing focus. And if you can't sort of make that mindset shift away from thinking of your business as, an, as a list of everything you possibly could do for a client and start thinking of it as what your clients will pay top dollar for, then unfortunately, you'll never become widely known for that thing that clients will pay top dollar for. And if you don't become known for it, a lot of the advantages of narrowing your focus never actually materialize. Before we go any further, I want to quickly say that there are other ways that you can obtain some of the benefits of positioning. I think it would be borderline irresponsible of me to not mention that some other things will deliver the results that people are looking for when they are, start thinking about positioning their business in a narrow focused way. For example, uh, luck for some people, I, I know some people like this, they've just lucked into a situation where maybe they uh, have a skill that's very highly valued at the moment and they have some uh, people who know that they can do that and just they don't have to really do much to get clients coming to them and to charge top dollar. Another way that works is uh, connections. If you have connections with the right people, that can bring you work without you having to really get serious about finding your own work. And that's fine. I see some people uh, doing the third item very well, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with it. They leverage an offshore team. So what they do is, you know, they're getting um, software development uh, offshore and paying X dollar an hour and charging, you know, a three to five uh, X multiple on what they're paying to get the work done. And, uh, you know, I mean, not literally pocketing the difference, but it's, it's a healthy profit margin for them. And that is certainly a, a viable business model that takes some of the, the pressure off of needing to, um, to narrow down your focus. However, even people in that situation where they're leveraging an offshore team, I still think uh, benefit from having a competitive advantage when it comes to finding clients. And I think narrowing your focus can provide that competitive advantage. The fourth way that I see people uh, take advantage of is they will ride a platform that's crossing the chasm from early adopter status to mainstream status. A good example of this from fairly recent uh, times is mobile. Mobile uh, at one point was like crazy bleeding edge early adopter stuff. And so uh, companies that recognize that were willing to invest heavily in it and pay above average rates for people who had expertise in mobile. And as a technology platform like that crosses the chasm to mainstream status, the rates go down almost inevitably. The rates go down and the supply side of the market gets more saturated. And that makes it much harder to get those awesome uh, profit margins from, from riding that platform. So just know that if your sort of uh, business development strategy is basically, well, I'm gonna be an iOS developer and that's just gonna bring me all the work I need, uh, for now, that may be true, but in you know, three, five, seven years, that is likely to change very significantly. Uh, that's not to say that mainstream tech platforms cannot be a viable way to uh, sort of position your business, but they do certainly have a life cycle that's outside your control, and you need to be aware of that as you're thinking about positioning your business. Here's why I think you should really, really think about going narrow if you're not already. Your potential clients are busy, they are overwhelmed with information, and essentially self-interested uh, people, as many of us are. They want a very exact match for their needs. They want to, if they're going to pay top dollar for, you know, uh, just picking an example off the top of my head, uh, database performance tuning, they don't want someone who does that and 10 other things. They want someone who is an exact match for their need. And that means that they are going to seek a specialist for that. Your potential clients are also usually very risk averse. They want to bet on somebody that has a really solid track record, not one that's all over the place. To, to do this requires change. To position yourself at that red dot and to, uh, you know, become known for doing that 
usually requires growth. Most people's comfort zone is sort of centered smack dab in the middle of that green circle representing stuff they can do. And that's fine. That's normal. But you need to start marketing yourself around that red circle. And that may require that you grow a bit to to, uh, end up in that position. You may have to acquire new skills which is, uh, for most people I know, is interesting and fun anyway. It's just they need to sort of uh, direct the effort that they would spend on acquiring 10 different skills and focus it on acquiring the skill that really their, their clients value the most. That growth is easier than you think because what you tend to do is you redirect energy that you might spend on managing multiple different learning curves And you direct that um, energy into your sort of singular focus for your business. That doesn't, that does not mean that you abandon those other interests, but it usually means that you redirect energy into that, that central focus. And what happens as a result is very interesting. You begin to gain expertise in your area of focus way faster, much, much faster than you're used to. So if you're, uh, you know, if you're doing like, three or four different things. If you're doing web development and search engine optimization and a little bit of copywriting and a little bit of something else, and you redirect all of that into one of those areas of focus, you will gain expertise dramatically faster. And the amazing thing about this to me is that you don't have to uh, sacrifice a lot to do it and you don't have to work any harder than you're working already You just have to um, make a a very difficult, very emotionally challenging decision to focus on that area that your clients care the most about. And you also have to do the work of finding out what they care the most about. So as a result, that expertise will allow you to deliver more business value to your clients. And I cannot think of a better reason for charging more and being more selective about who you work with than the fact that you deliver a lot of business value. That makes all the tricks and the shenanigans that we normally go through to raise our rates so much easier. We don't have to, you know, fool anybody into paying us more. We just have to say, well, uh, you know, if you care a lot about this, I'm quite good at that. In fact, I'm, I'm extremely focused on it and I have an amazing track record. These are my rates. The whole thing becomes a lot easier. Again, that's because you're working full-time on your client's problems. You're not multitasking between a bunch of different types of client problems. That makes you better at risk mitigation because you learn where things can go wrong and you learn to avoid those things. Sometimes you learn them the hard way, but you learn you do that learning curve a lot faster than someone who is doing a little bit of SEO and a little bit of web development and, and so on. You begin to learn your client's native language. You sort of understand what they mean at a deeper level. And that better communication usually makes projects go a lot better, which, again, is a really a risk mitigation strategy. But at the end of the day, it's worth paying more for for a project that's more likely to be successful. You begin to understand your client's business environment better. So you start to understand their business model and you can start making proactive suggestions that may, they may not have even thought of that can deliver you know, real benefit to them. So at the at the end of the day, you're providing better advice because you're more experienced in what it is that you do. All of that makes you grow from being a vendor to a partner. And this is sort of a, a nasty characterization, but <laughs> vendors on the one hand try to minimize the amount of risk that they take on in any way. And partners don't do that. Partners are there to share risk And as a result, they get uh, much more of the reward that's attached with uh, sharing that risk and they can charge higher rates. All of these things uh, reduce your cost of acquiring a new client. So when you focus in in a narrow area, it's much easier for word of mouth to begin bringing you clients. Your marketing is much more effective because, for example, when a client goes to your website, they're not seeing, uh, you know, a portfolio or a list of case studies or a list of previous work that's all over the place. They're seeing a list of previous work that makes them go, wow, these people really do focus on this. And and what that does for their level of trust is uh, it, it dramatically increases their level of trust. 
So you're going to lower the perceived risk of working with you when you focus in this way. And last but not least, you make it possible to capture a leadership position. You simply cannot become known as a leader in your market without narrowing your focus. And when you do become known as a leader, you get all kinds of really cool stuff. Uh, you start getting asked for quotes in press. If, you know, if your industry is large enough to be covered by press, you start being asked to speak at conferences. These, these things don't happen without a little bit of work, but they happen much more readily and much more frequently if you are in a, some sort of leadership position. That's it. That's what I have. Uh, that's, I think, the best way I can spend uh, 15 minutes telling you about uh, positioning. There's my timer. Oops, let's see here. Uh, hold on a second. Let me get myself back on. There we go. Okay, I would love to answer some questions. Uh, sweet, we've got some questions. Uh, so I'm going to invite uh, unpronounceable username on screen. <laughs> and what you're going to see on your end is you're going to see a little box that pops up and says, hey, do you want to participate? Do you want to go on screen? You can choose yes or no. And then uh, you will... Uh, get a little microphone test, a video test. Once you get through that, you'll be on screen. Hello. There you are. <laughs> what is your name? My name is Josiah. Um, Josiah. My screen name, Kickenbach. <laughs> awesome. Okay, Josiah Kickenbach. How do you know when you've niched down far enough? Um, yeah. So uh, there's a couple things I'll, I'll say, and then I want to hear your reactions to this because uh, I'd love to know a little bit about what you do and so forth. Um, it hurts is the first thing like emotionally it hurts because you you can't believe that that it's possible it the physics the, the like the math doesn't seem to work out when you've niched down far enough um you're like no way no way could i uh, uh get enough clients with a market that small um no way are they going to find me the world is so big and that's one way you know, and I can explain more about that if you want, but that's like a, a real clear sign you'll get. Um, the other is you can kind of look out there at, and forgive me if you've heard me say this before, but you can look at the conferences that are out there and the most specific conference you can find for the type of company you're going after or the type of client you're going after will sort of match your positioning. So, um, You'll see that, and and that's kind of an external sign that uh, that actually you don't have to even narrow down. You can just do that research and start looking at the conferences that are out there. The reason that works is people who put together conferences are sort of natural connectors. They tend to know the market before they set up a conference in it. They tend to be insiders in the market. And so the, the way they set up a conference tends to reflect how the market is structured. So those are two things you can look for. but Josiah, I'm actually kind of curious, what do you do and, and what are you thinking about niching down on? I mean, actually, right now, I, um, I've i been uh, learning web development and I've been uh, in, in um, I currently work for a company as a, as a developer advocate, but okay. I, 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 and so there's some marketing with that, uh -huh. but specifically, like, I have looked to do some things on my own and uh, in a, in a, previous life earlier on i was uh, uh very much of a freelance um a freelancer and, and a in you know essentially in some ways a consultant okay but niching down I, so then i didn't niche down mm -hmm. and it worked out okay um but then at the same time i did leave it uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, and so as i have gone into as i've gone into um you know, web development, trying to establish that um, consultant business on the side and and begin to grow that. I've had a very difficult time really mm -hmm. finding that niche and really going. Okay, like now I'm niched down far enough, or like okay. now, like this is. Um, and I, I think that the conferencing is very interesting. I hadn't heard that before, but uh, that can be a good way to sort of sur survey what's out there, and um, it, it almost like kind of maps out 
the world of business for you because uh, it, people in you know biz, in market vertical A want to go to a conference that is tailored for them, and they want to hire a web developer who works just with them. So if you, you can kind of match up with the way the conference landscape is organized, and it's also very easy to research on the internet, so you don't have to, mm. you know, you don't have to interview people or bug people. You can just almost any real conference that's um, trying to attract people is going to advertise online. So mm. I would look at that. Um, the other quick tip I can give you is the easiest place to start because you're in sort of that generalist position. Easiest place to start is yeah. uh, focusing on a market vertical or an audience. So, you know, trucking companies or regional trucking companies or, uh, you know, long distance trucking companies, those are all market verticals. And that would be, I'm not saying you have to focus on trucking companies. I'm just saying as an example. Sure. Um, so that's the easiest place to start because it builds up word of mouth the quickest. So the one thing along with that is that I've always worried that the market that I do know and have connections with the most, the one that I came from, yep. if I were to go back to that, I don't, be, I don't honestly believe that I have the, that, that they would have enough money to support a career. Okay. Um, it, kind of as a general, is that, is that like a fair argument or is that, you know, I maybe, don't know. Maybe. Um, the, uh, there are certain industries uh, or certain markets where you will run into a rate ceiling. Um, okay. and, and I can't tell you what they are. It just, I know they're out there. Um, mm. but, uh, if you can get beyond pr just providing coding services and you can start to provide a solution, that rate mm. ceiling goes up a lot. <laughs> it gotcha. became, so gotcha. I would not just dismiss the market out of hand before you know a lot about it. And yeah. you may find that there are consultants out there where what they do is a little bit of coding and a little bit of sort of business advice and mm -hmm. their rates are a lot higher than the people who do just the coding. Sure. Makes so I, I know that may seem like a far, far way off, but it, it really could just be a year or 18 months out for you. Um, mm -hmm. The the least valuable thing that you can provide is your coding services. There's uh, if you can learn how to use those to make a difference for a business, that's going to be the, the thing that has real value. Gotcha. Cool. All right. Does that help? Yeah, definitely. Awesome. Okay. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go down to the next one. And so the next question is, what do you do after you position yourself? Just rake in the money. <laughs> Not really. Um, here's what happens after. And I'm going to go ahead and, and start answering your question, Daniel. Um, and... Uh, and hopefully you'll be able to make it on screen for some follow-up. But if if not, that's okay. Oh, and then Tracy, if you want to ask a question, ask it at the bottom there. I just happened to notice you popped a question in there. Just ask it at the bottom center with that red button. So, Danielle, um, after you position yourself, you start to market yourself based on that position. And this is, uh, to be honest, it gets a little uh, complicated at this point. Hey, <laughs> how are you doing, Daniel? Is it Daniel or Danielle or... Tell me. Uh, it's uh, it's Daniele. Since I'm Daniele, Israel. got it. Okay. But I stand for the international audience. <laughs> okay. Welcome, Dan. Thank you for your question. Thank you. So um, let me give you the general answer, and then I want you to just tell me any kind of follow up questions you have, or uh, you know, we'll get more specific. So in general, after you've position, after you've made that choice about how you're going to position your business and where you're going to narrow down you start to market yourself based on that choice. And I, I was about to say, that's where it gets a little complicated because a lot of people go, wait a second, this is a change from where I was before and I'm not sure I want to do this a big change. It, it exposes my business to a lot of risk to make a change like this. What if my existing clients um, say, you know, what if they fire me or they all leave? or whatever, <laughs> right? So um, you can make it a, a progressive change. If you look on my website at philipmorganconsulting.com, there's an article in the article section called a minimum viable funnel. Some of you have already seen it. It's, it's how I think you can start making that change. So you can basically set up a marketing, uh, a very simple, minimal way of starting to acquire customers that's centered around this new position. 
and you can leave whatever you're doing alone. You cannot touch it. You don't have to go overhaul your website or do a new website or just, you know, totally rebrand yourself overnight. What you can do is start to gradually start acquiring uh, new clients around this position. So that might look like, well, actually, why don't you tell me, what, what do you do now? And are you thinking about changing that? Yeah, so I I wrote another question uh, mm-hmm. in, the, in the comments and that explains it, but I, I will I will uh, just uh, say that. Um, so basically, I'm uh, I I have a copywriting business. Okay. Um, I oh, have, I, I remember your other question now. Okay, go ahead and say it though for I the have, benefit of the audience. Uh, yeah. So um, yeah, I have uh, one employee. Mm-hmm. Basically, we work with um, uh, tech and marketing companies internet startups uh even even among the most famous ones in this space and we mostly do blogging mm-hmm. um so we like we went from you know the uh, gen- generic freelance writer mm-hmm. uh we like i used to charge like ridiculous uh <laughs> rates uh-huh. To you know, uh, like a good um, niche down blogging service mm-hmm. around uh, digital marketing topics. Okay. Um, so, uh, but lately, like I, 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 I had the chance to work uh, on um, on two white papers with the mm-hmm. big brands, mm-hmm. and I saw like a, a big difference in terms of you know the uh, the type of income that can get from this and the type of relationship that you can get with the client, better mm-hmm. clients, better rates. Yes. So I, I thought about actually, uh, niching down to white mm-hmm. paper. So mm-hmm. I was, I, I, I thought, uh, like, mm, should I become like a white paper writer? So what should I be in the mind of, of, uh, of my potential client should it be just the white paper writer and like compete with other people who are in the leading positions in in this field or should it be white paper writer for i don't know software as a service companies or should it be white paper writer on a specific topic so i, I know that you 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 basically you you are in a similar field so you you probably have a <laughs> Great advice on this. Yeah, I have some background with this. I uh, I was uh, I started out as a technical writer, and then, like you, became very interested in white papers. I found it more interesting and challenging, and just more enjoyable. The, the longer form writing is what I'm talking about. So, a couple ideas for you. Um, I would encourage you to think about what you're doing as a progression from where you are to where you want to be of several steps, not just one big step. Um, And the next small step would be to become the white paper writer for insert market vertical. So SaaS companies, um, self-funded SaaS companies, bootstrap SaaS companies, funded SaaS companies, some, some way to narrowly segment the, the market and just be the right, the white paper writer for them. Um, the advantages you'll start to get is you'll get more referrals, not, not overnight, not right away, but over time, the referral momentum will build up and word of mouth will build up. If, uh, if you can successfully, um, you know, pull off, uh, three or four projects, you can have a very impressive, very focused portfolio, um, that speaks to how you focus on this particular market. And, um, and, and that would be the first small step I would take. Eventually, I think what's going to happen just very naturally is that you're going to feel you're going to hit an upper limit as to what you can do with, uh, rates and so forth with that position. And so you'll need to, uh, grow into a new position, which is going to be something like, uh, it may not be full service marketing for a type of client, but you'll start to focus more on the problem and less on the tool that's used to solve the problem. So you'll start thinking, okay, what what problem does does my why does my client want to pay for a white paper? It's not because you know they think it's cool to have white papers. <laughs> it's because they use them as a sales tool, 
and um, as a potentially as a marketing tool and sometimes both, right? It just kind of depends on the company. So you'll start be just naturally becoming interested in, hmm, what if I can uh, take the problem that white papers solve and just offer my clients that I can solve that problem for them? And you'll start doing that and you'll find that you can charge more and it's easier to sell because you're not selling the input, you're selling the solution. But I would look at that as a process and not force, not try to force yourself to, you know, go all the way. And, um, and, and so once you've, you know, kind of made those steps, you're going to be in a very different position than you are now. And each, each step along the way, you'll have to market yourself. So, um, I don't know how work comes to you now. I don't know if you sub for agencies or if you get clients directly. Um, is it one of those two or something else? Uh, so clients directly for the blogging okay. and through agencies mm-hmm. for uh, the white papers with it, just two projects. Okay. Well, congratulations. Uh, I think white papers are so much fun to write. I think that you're, you're just going to have a lot of fun doing that anyway, but uh, what you'll need to start doing is building your own way to acquire clients. And that is what will take your business, I think, where you want it to go. And um, so you need to have some way of marketing yourself. I'm a big fan of going on podcasts and teaching something to the audience um, and then sending them back to some sort of lead magnet so they get on my list and I can market to them over time. That's why all of these people are here is <laughs> because you're on my list. I did not announce this webinar to anybody other than my list. So um, I don't know. What what else could I answer for you about that? I, I don't want to just to turn into a big giant monologue. <laughs> yeah, no, it, it was uh, interesting. And, and thanks for the advice. I, I do have one more question maybe. Mm-hmm. Uh, you say um, start from a very uh, specific niche. Mm-hmm. like self-funded SaaS companies. Sure. So how would you test this? Like, how would you make this decision to, how would you pick that specific um, market? Okay, I would do several things. And uh, the one thing I cannot do for you is uh, make it so that you don't, at some point, have to take a small leap of faith. It It, it just... It it requires a small leap of faith. But what I can do is give you some ideas for getting data and reducing the uh, the risk of that small leap of faith. So uh, the data I think you should have is how many other companies sell a similar solution or the same solution to that market. And that sh- you should be able to find that out through some internet research. Um, the uh, I would look at the conferences again and see like, um, you know, MicroConf is essentially a conference for self-funded startups, right? So that's a, that's an indication that if there's this conference called MicroConf, which there is, and it sells out in like five seconds <laughs> every year, that's a really good indicator that there's people who are interested in that, right? So look for those because uh, we're just going with the, ex- the uh, example of self-funded SaaS companies, but, you know, that's not the only market you could go after. Uh, and in fact, you may need to sort of look bigger because uh, white papers tend to get more popular in in bigger enterprise companies, at least in my experience. It's not that those are the only companies that do it. But anyway, as you're looking around, so look at the conference landscape and see if there's a conference that reflects the the type of company you're going after. The last thing I would suggest is I'm always recommending this book, Lean uh, Customer Development by Cindy Alvarez because it uh, it teaches you how to do research about a problem. Now, the, the book is written for people who are trying to build a product, and you're not trying to build a product, you're trying to build a service. But I think the advice will be very applicable anyway. So I would read that and follow her advice there. And I think those are three tools you can use to get more data. If you have conversations with people, that's really the key is talking to people in the market you're thinking about going after you will um, that will do more to build up your confidence that this is either a good or bad area to focus on than anything else is those conversations. It's really um, those are what I think is going to ultimately give you the confidence to move in one direction or the other. 
Yeah, yeah, I understand. I understand. Well, the the the, the difference between you know uh, service and product is something interesting, and I think maybe you you could do if if you are, I mean, if you are uh, up for it, you could do another another micro nap on uh, product productized service because uh, that that's actually what I how I uh, came to know you through Brian uh, Kazel or Kazel. Yeah, Brian Castle. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, that's that's very interesting. So uh, just just so uh, just just to understand, uh, maybe it can be of interest to other people working with agencies. So you suggest like moving away from agencies or just uh, trying to uh, I don't know, trying to add to the to that. What I recommend, yeah, yeah, that's a good question. Um, don't uh, do anything, you know, don't do anything that jeopardizes your revenue, but try to add a new way of acquiring clients that, that you own and control. What I found with agencies um, is as a, when I was positioned as basically as a writer or a technical writer, the, the rate ceiling was like 60 or $70 an hour. And uh, it was very hard to get a, get beyond that. Um, in, in certain parts of the U S uh, 60 to $70 an hour doesn't take you very far. <laughs> and that happens to be one of the parts of the U S where I live, the San Francisco Bay area. So that's, uh, there's nothing wrong with agencies and they definitely, um, I mean, well, the other thing is it's hard to use the work that you do for them in your portfolio, which is, yeah. uh, kind of a problem. So, yes, yes. I, I'd really like to showcase the. You know the logo of the company actually did the the the, the white paper for, but uh, I cannot. And yeah, so that's that's also very important. I cannot get a recommendation from them. Uh, yeah, and I'm curious, baby. I mean, you can uh, you probably have a better understanding of this. Uh, we, uh, if I told you that this like an agency uh, gives you work, mm -hmm. right? And you have to uh, quote for this word. You have to give a quote. Yes. And you quote. Uh, okay. Let's say. Let's say you quote six thousand. Okay. Mm -hmm. For this, uh, and they like they they don't blink. They they don't even blink, and they say mm -hmm. yes. Okay. What do you think is their is their profit on this? Um. Well, I would normally an agency is going to need to do a two to three X markup on their cost for, to, you know, to cover all the other expenses that they have. Cause they did the hard work of finding the client and, and that's, you know, that's just, that's why they get to take that, you know, that cut of the, of the profit. But I would, it depends on the agency, of course, but I would guess, you know, two to three X what you're charging. Uh, sometimes more just depends. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's okay. Cool. Thanks. Uh, Thanks a lot. Dan, nice to meet you. I'm going to, um, let's see, I'm going to move on to the next question here. I'm just going in order that these are. So, Megan, I'm going to invite you on screen. And uh, I want to ask, let's see. And then Dan, you when, whenever you're ready, you can I can kick you out or you can kick yourself out. Oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> I will kick myself out. Okay. So, <laughs> bye, Dan. So here's the question. I love the positioning manual, but I'm still having trouble narrowing a target market slash niche. How do I determine it? Is it purely who I who you want to work with or who I want to work with? And um that's part of it. Uh I I you know I, I work with a lot of freelancers and people who sort of left. Uh, the world of corporate work or left the world of having a job because they just, they wanted more autonomy and more control over what they did. And I, I'm right there with you. I mean, that's pretty much why I work for myself, even though at times uh, I was kind of an idiot for sticking with it because I had no idea what I was doing and I just did everything sort of the wrong way and really suffered for that. Um, I still did it because at least I had control over what I did, at least some control. So I would never say you just have to go where the money is and suck it up. Um, 
But at the same time, that's why I, I sort of draw the, that first slide in this presentation. It shows those two overlapping circles. I don't expect, I do not expect people to completely change what they're interested in and acquire a completely different, unrelated uh, group of skills just so they can make more money. But what I do suggest people do is um, just try to find that overlap between where they have something to offer and what their clients need. So I would say it's not purely who you want to work with, but I can say that um, when times are good, uh, that's great. But when times are not good, it sure helps if you have clients that you like working with. At least it does for me. And um, so I think that's a big factor, like who you want to work with and who you really get along with and who you click with. But what I would say is uh, I also talk to a lot of people where the reason they're even interested in positioning at all is because they have had a string of really negative experiences with whatever industry they kind of landed in when they first started freelancing. So, you know, I don't know, maybe they're a developer or a graphic designer, doesn't really matter. And they just kind of landed in a certain industry and they just hate it. Uh, they hate what it, the people are in that industry tend to be like, and they just hate being around that kind of business. And, um, you know, in that case, uh, even if you're making great money, this sometimes the money starts kind of stops to matter when you realize you just hate the industry you're in. So I really do think that stuff matters, Megan. Uh, you know, whether you're in an industry that you care about, but at the same time, um, the, the real mistake that a lot of freelancers make is they get obsessed about what they want and they don't think at all about what their clients need. And so they're kind of condemned to charging low rates for a long, really for until they change that because they can't sort of get out of that mindset of, well, I'm a person who's good at coding. Um, so that's what I'm going to do. And I don't care. I, that's just what I'm going to do. And I think that mindset keeps a lot of people locked in lower rates. And if you can, so what I encourage people to do is think of yourself as an investor in your own business and you are investing your own time, your own skills into your own business. And I think when you make that subtle little shift, it sort of frees you up to stop saying, well, I have the skills I have today and that's what I'm limited at. And I think it frees you up to start thinking about, well, what, you know, what if I want this business to do better? What investment does it need for me to do better? Does it need a slightly different set of skills? Do I need to learn some new stuff? Do I need to temporarily invest a lot more time in it to create some growth? Um, you start, I, in my experience, thinking in those ways. And I think that helps, um, it, it helps get people unstuck a little bit. Um, I... I think that's an okay answer to your question, but, uh, you know, if you want to comment and ask some follow-up questions, that would be fine. I'm going to move on to the next one, uh, which is a, I love this question. Ari, I'm inviting you on screen. Um, I love this question because it's so common. It's one I have dealt with personally myself and handled very uh, poorly. The question is, how do you position yourself when you are in two separate niches and I have uh, put myself sort of in that position and I, I don't like being there. So I'm going to give you the personal answer and then I'm going to um, let you tell me what you think of that personal answer. So um, I have, uh, I sort of experimented with a, a sideline service uh, called um, Drip Sherpa. I built up a lot of experience working with uh, drip marketing automation software and um and thought, you know, why don't I just build a productized service around this? And so what I realized is that's fine, but it doubles the amount of marketing work you have to do if you're, you know, if these two niches don't have a lot to do with each other and you can't somehow repurpose the marketing you're doing for both, then all of a sudden, even if you're the only person behind the, these two niches, you're kind of running two companies. And I don't care about how many times uh, Fortune magazine profiles some uh, person that runs like five companies. It's like, it's more work. And, you know, that person has a team and I don't. I'm a solo person. Hey, 
Oh. Sorry, it took me a second to install that. That's okay. Yeah, yeah, that's that's what happens. Ari, welcome. Thank you. Um, so that's my hesitation about positioning in multiple niches is it it increases the marketing effort. But now that you're here, why don't you give me a little more detail on on that question? Cool. So I um, a beha- I'm a behavioral marketing consultant. So I use psychological triggers and emotional magnetism to help magnify people's marketing expert uh, uh, efforts. Okay. What I find is that that is be- that best works in the copywriting niche because mm-hmm. of uh, just by virtue of it being a ri- the written word is in everything. It's in video scripts. It's in. It's just it trans. It, it goes across all right. all spaces. So those really are the two two areas where I find the most work. Now, uh-huh. the where, 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 copywriting and then what's the other one? Like the behavioral marketing because okay. I mean, uh, what I, uh, I've consulted with a bunch of businesses on ways to improve that and I've done it through like bios. Generally speaking, email marketing is where it works almost best. It, yeah. it, that's where I get the most enjoyment out of it is working on email, cold mm-hmm. emails or email campaigns. Um, but I've done landing pages and it just crosses all barriers. Okay. The problem is, is that I, I, I have this, so I have this behavioral marketing expertise um, and then I have this copywriting expertise and uh-huh. there's some crossover, but how do you position for both of those? Or is it better for me just to say, okay, I'm going to do, because behavioral marketing takes a lot of education. Like uh, businesses don't understand. When I say that, they're like, I, I don't understand what you're, what okay. you're talking about. One way to uh, fix that um, or to, to bring those together is to focus on the problem you solve rather than the inputs to that problem. So right. the inputs are copywriting or the skill that you have. What's the problem you're solving? So what I uh, – that's interesting. So what, what I like to look at it is how to get – and keep your clients or customers. Okay. So the, the product is how to get more customers. Okay. So the real problem, if you were gonna take it even a step further, is aligning your, <laughs> yeah, I know my daughter, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> <That's> um, <laughs> the real problem is aligning your message with your audience so that they hear it. So I, I the, the, best, the best way I explain this to clients is if you're speaking French and your audience speaks English, it's gonna be totally lost. So I yeah. do the same thing, is I look at what um, I, I look at what you're trying to say. I actually do some uh, customer research and I help align those messages. Okay. I, I, I do. I mean, I've seen other people. I mean, I'm, I'm sort of in the same boat because uh, if I focus on the inputs or the tools that I use, uh, I'm, I'm talking about things like positioning and education-based content marketing and, and marketing automation. But if I focus on the outcome or the result, it's like I want to help the custom software development shops get more leads. So I, I f- strongly feel like there's some, there's some kind of message in there about the problem you solve. And if you were to sort of orient your positioning around that, and then you could combine it with a, a focus on a market vertical or an audience, which you know, that may or may not be possible right now, but the starting point would be, wh- what do you help them do? What do you help them get more of? Uh, I help you acquire more clients with, you know, with the same amount that you're spending now or, you know, with w- whatever. I-, I think there's a way to craft a message that focuses on that. And that would be one way to solve it. Another way it is not what I'd recommend, but you could just set up like two different company identities and, you know, try to acquire clients around, so much work. It's, it, well, it's at least double the work plus the context switching. So that's why I don't really recommend it. I don't, I can't, I, I can't do that. And the client work, I, I, I mean, even if I wanted to, yeah, um, I wouldn't be able to, to go that route. I mean, I, to me, yeah. it's, it's like the best I can do is take a, take a, a specific, like you said, vertical mm-hmm. and say, okay, so for real estate agents, I'm going to help you communicate through your bio and yeah. then market that to them, maybe through cold emails or position it that way to them yeah. and kind of make it as, see, it still goes back to the copywriting because that's what I would be doing, or at least that's the vehicle. That's the tool. Might not yeah, be. that's that's yeah. the input. That's the tool. Um, yeah, I just, um, even after getting a few more details from you, I, I would not recommend anything different other than try to find the problem that gets them i mean why why do they pick up the phone to call you or why do they start searching around online if you can target that problem i think that's going to unify these these different threads okay so really it may, it may be positioning differently for each vertical 
correct? I mean, is that kind of what you're saying? Like, or do I just say, okay, I'm only going to focus my business now on some specific demographic, like real estate agents or whatever it might be. It's the latter, which is kind of the, the Facebook strategy where they, you know, they made their service available and for one audience, you know, and then they sort of siloed out horizontally over time. So that's where it gets scary. That's where people go, kind of freeze up and, you know, get stage fright or whatever is like, okay, okay, I, I understand what you're saying, Philip. I, I think you're right. But how do I pick one? Because I have clients all over the map or they all seem really attractive. Or if I pick one, is that going to, you know, slice my profitability in half or my business volume? And it, it almost never does. You, you just replace the the breadth that you're losing with depth and it works out better, but it, it certainly is possible to make a mistake at that point where you're like, where you pick the wrong niche. But I would just kind of pick the one where actually not even the biggest one, it may be the smallest one, but the one where you can um, acquire the most clients quickly because you have, you know, a lot right. of connections there or what have you. Here's the other thing is people are going to continue to refer you. Even if you're the, um, you know, I, I help real estate agents get more clients guy. You'll still get, you'll still get referrals from outside that specialty. And then you can just decide whether you want to take that work on or not. Okay. That's awesome. That's really helpful actually. Cool. Okay. That is super, it's so counterintuitive, but it's super helpful. What I'd encourage you to do is look around to find examples of people who are doing that. Um, and, and just, Maybe even talk to them. Just reach out and say, hey, I noticed you're very narrowly focused. Uh, can I ask you some questions about how that's going for you? So don't just believe me, <laughs> but, you know, right. do your research. I, I don't want your baby to go without food. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I get it. I'm with you. Yeah. All right. A anything cool. else I can answer for you, Ari? No, I think that's 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 pretty solid now. I know some others have questions, and I don't want to capitalize all the time. Right on. Well, nice meeting you. Likewise. Thanks so much for doing this. You bet. Okay, the next one, there's a bunch of, uh, oh, here we go. doesn't matter. So, Ryan, I'm going to invite you on screen. Feel free to pop in if you'd like. doesn't matter if your LinkedIn shows uh, a track record in areas outside your positioning. In general, how much do Google results matter for your, uh, for your name? Google results for your name. Okay, how much do Google results for your name? So somebody types your name into Google. How much does that matter? Hey, Ryan, um, that's an awesome question. Uh, and I, I think one that's very relevant to all kinds of people because, uh, no one is born and, and like for their first job goes super duper narrow. I, I, I never see that happen. It, I mean, maybe it does, but I, I don't ever see it happen. So I think it does not matter a lot. I think, um, first of all, I think as soon as you can, you should sort of, uh, curate your, the marketing channels that you control which uh, I think partially includes LinkedIn, although you can have people doing stuff like recommending you for weird things. But I think I think LinkedIn gives you a good amount of control there, uh, even so. But uh, basically, as soon as you can, as soon as you can start to demonstrate some sort of credibility around the position that you've chosen, you should start to make your marketing channels reflect that if you're comfortable committing to that position. Now, again, earlier I was answering or talking about the case where maybe you're not comfortable quite yet. And so what you do is you kind of set up a shadow way of acquiring clients that doesn't really conflict with what, you, what your main web presence is. Um, so I'm, I'm talking about you, you've gotten past that point and you're just ready to, to go all in on this new position. Um, there's, there's, yes, there's going to be a, uh, a sort of paper trail online of weird goofy stuff that you did in the past that has nothing to do with what you're doing now you'll find it on me if you search deep enough here's the thing it is so easy once you go narrow and you do a little bit of marketing it's so easy to completely bury that stuff two three pages down on google where nobody nobody goes that far back unless they're like doing a background check on you and if the, if that happens and if you get a client who's like you know you look great but um, you know, it seems like two years ago you were, uh, doing, you were like a, a clown for hire at, at birthday parties. 
there's almost always a way to say, you know what, you're right. And um, I'm so excited about this new focus, but it did take me a while to get there. And I learned a lot on the way. And, you know, I think it's going to benefit you in the, in the following way. So I wouldn't worry about it. Um, so it matters very little is the very short answer to your question. Cool. I'm the next guy too. And this, the, this first question was less interesting to me, so I'm happy to <laughs> okay, move, well, on. Let's move on to the next one. Uh, how do you find a who? I mean, okay. How do, oops, sorry. How do you find a who if your existing who is too oriented to your comfort zone? So tell me what you mean by that real briefly. So, um, <laughs> I uh, the biggest issue I've run into maybe it's the fear I've uh, or, or maybe not I don't know but uh, it's um, I um, you know the, the things that I can do them that are the most valuable are the you know are kind of the it's kind of like you have the comfort zone circle you have in these slides mm -hmm. you know and like way out on a limb and you know I, I yeah I can deliver the value but yeah. You know, that's not what I like to think about. And, and I am kind of like outside of my social zone. And, I, yeah. you know, I, I'm, you know, I don't know anything about researching potential clients. All of that is like, you know, seems like, you know, yeah. gigantic rush of like, ah. yeah. Um, yeah. So, <laughs> you know, so um, and the who and, and actually the reason why I asked the question is, you know, um, I have who's the current who's that are nonprofits and where I am a commodity. Uh -huh. Right, right. Yeah, small nonprofits that can barely afford me already. Okay. Uh, okay. <laughs> all right. Um, th and those are, those are both like very intentional, like safe choices in the past that I've made. Um, I'm ready, you know, I've delivered value for, you know, companies you've heard of and all this stuff. But, you know, when I went out freelancing, that was, you know, I went down to, you know, uh, very, very safe things because I was the one having to get on the phone. No, so. I get it. I, like, I mean, I, I can relate when I, uh, started freelancing, like I, I didn't, even, I did not even want a client to give me a, like a password to their web server. I was just so concerned <laughs> right. that I was going to screw something up. <laughs> like, so I, I totally relate. And I, I think the answer is it, you just have to say, what's the, I mean, it's helpful if you have a, some kind of vague vision. And by the way, I'm, we're going past the hour here and I'm fine with that. I'm having a blast. So uh, I'm probably going to keep answering a few more questions until people just leave me here by, by myself. <laughs> anyway, so of course it's helpful if you have a sort of a vision for like, okay, I think the, the, the combination of money and clients that I would enjoy working with is, you know, like, is it North? Is it East? Is it South? Is it West? Like that level of, a vision is very helpful, right? Because then you can start to incrementally move in that direction and you can start to say, okay, what's a project that I could, um, you know, uh, propose or what's, what's a need that they have that is a, just a step outside my comfort zone, but not radically way outside it. Right. But I just wonder if, if, if even that level of clarity is where you're at yet, or if you're still more just like, I don't know, uh, here's where I am and I just don't know where I want to go. Yeah. I mean, I have a, my, I've been wrestling with this for weeks. Mm -hmm. Uh, you have been in your email box a few times. Uh, <laughs> um, nice. and, uh, um, really what I'm trying to do is, uh, the, the, the path that I'm kind of trying to take is take the things that seem most promising and most like, um, the biggest customer demand, you know, the, the biggest, most expensive problems that I am solving right now for my existing customers say, you know, put up a billboard that says, you know, that, you know, okay, you know, here's an expensive business problem that I do solve. And then, mm -hmm. you know, see if there's something adjacent that I get to, as I like find, get in more of those conversations. That's what I'm hoping that, to walk it kind of. Right. And I think that's the right approach. Um, you know, there's just no point in creating a kind of overwhelming situation for yourself because that's counterproductive. Uh, it is for me, if I try to bite off more than I can chew and I think it is for most people. So, um, it just sort of respect the fact that change takes time. Change is not easy for anybody. And, um, the other thing I was going to say is, is sometimes the, the way to 
get out of a sort of rate ceiling. It's just to go up market in terms of organization size. So you can take the same skills you apply, you can take your track record, and you can just it, it sort of leverage whatever connections you might have within that market vertical and just say, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna go after bigger clients. Uh, that's something I'm I'm considering doing myself is uh, is just kind of going after larger development shops because they've got more budget. And uh, I mean, not to make this about me, but like the reason that I no. <laughs> went small was like, I want to work with the owner of the company, not the director of marketing. Right. And, and a certain organization size, that's what happens is you stop working with the owner and you start working with director of marketing. But I, I think eventually I'm just gonna have to get over that <laughs> and just say, okay, uh, I'll work with the director of marketing because they have a budget and they have a need that aligns directly with what I offer and they might actually even be not as busy as the owner of the company. So maybe there's some upside in it, but yeah, just think about kind of going uh, up market in terms of organization size, uh, at least explore that. Um, but I'm, you're not alone. There's a lot of people who feel like they're kind of in a cul-de-sac where the place where they have all their experience and all their skills and all their street cred and track record is a place they want to get out of. <laughs> and uh, it's, I know it's not easy, but I think you can kind of bootstrap your way out of that. Uh, but I, I guess I would just start with sort of exploring, like you said, the adjacent um, possibilities. Very good. Thanks. Hope it helps. Nice to meet it you, does. Ryan. Yeah, you okay. too. Thanks. All right. Uh, let me get uh, it on answering myself here. Out here. Okay. Chris, I'm inviting you onto the screen. I haven't even read your question. Let's see, what does it take? What does taking on more risk as a partner entail specifically? Uh, simple, dumb. Uh, while, while you're um, getting set up there, I'll I'll give a few thoughts, and then we can discuss this hopefully real time. Um, simple, dumb things like I'm going to. Uh, I'll just put this in the sort of. I'll frame this in my own experience. Like when I started out, I was positioning myself as a writer and the way I thought was I'm a pretty good writer. You're hiring me to write, but that's all I'm going to do for you. Um, I'm, I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to ask for access to your WordPress installs so that I can, um, you know, put this blog post up for you. That's you. That's your problem. Uh, I'm just the writer here. And I think anytime you uh, catch yourself saying, I'm just the blank, you are uh, potentially uh, thinking more like a vendor and less like a partner. So to me, a partner is thinking, how can I make this easier for you? You hired me to um, you know, create this thing, but there's like these two or three other things that need to happen for that to, you know, to take place. How maybe I can make those things happen for you. So um, naturally, it's a slip, slippery slope because I'm not going to you know, come into a client and say, I'm going to help you generate leads and then I'm doing customer service for them. Uh, that's not really how that works. But um, to me, that's uh, that's part of that sort of uh, thinking about it like a partner. Uh, now, taking on more risk, uh, I think the the main thing there is that you start to offer more strategy advice and it's less like you know the client says well what do you think is best and you kind of hem and haw around that question and you're like well i don't know um you're more willing to say you know what in my experience uh for this reasons this is best and for this reasons you may not want to do this and you're, you're kind of more willing to have a guiding hand in the direction of their business and this doesn't happen all overnight this doesn't happen on the first you know date so to speak but eventually I, I think a partner will start to become an advisor to the business and um so to me that's a specific uh way in which a, a partner takes on more risk because if you give advice uh and it doesn't work out um you know they're not going to sue you most likely unless it was completely irresponsible advice but it's kind of on you. <laughs> and to me, that's that's part of the risk that a partner takes on. Uh, I don't know if that was a awesome answer to your question or not, but hopefully that helps. And uh, let's see if we're gonna move on. Tracy, I'm gonna invite you on screen to 
uh, discuss this question. How do you determine if your chosen positioning is the right one? There's a simple answer, which is kind of a, a snarky answer. Simple answer is you make more money and you have an easier time getting clients. Um, that is uh, simplified and I don't know, maybe not really a real answer, but uh, that's one way you know. I think what you might be getting at, though, is like a little bit before that happens, there is a sort of valley of uncertainty. Hi, Tracy. Nice to meet you. Um, okay. Oh, you're gone. Oh, you're back. <laughs> there we go. Okay. So your question is, how do you determine if your position is the right one? I, I suspect you're kind of getting at like before the money starts rolling in, in wheelbarrows, is that kind of what you're asking about? Or may, just give me a little more detail. Yeah, on that. Uh, you know, in terms of um, the response that you get from, um, you know, your target clients, that market. Okay. Yeah. Okay. One thing I notice is uh, I, in this, uh, this is in my own experience and others, the first contact, first time I hear from them, they are asking things that are not like trying to vet me or figure out if I'm some kind of idiot. They are more questions around like, when can you start? Uh, what are your rates? They're, they're further into the buying process, in other words. And um, again, that doesn't happen overnight, but I notice that's a big difference that I notice. And um, so their their trust level is much higher on the first contact. And the reason why is not because I'm an amazing marketer. It's just because when they go to my site, they see that I solve one problem. Uh, any case studies reinforce that that's what I do. The portfolio reinforces that's what you do. Uh, can I ask what you do? Uh, I have two niches, pretty much okay. online. <laughs> um, I have, but uh, I'm a I'm a journalist. Okay. Uh, and a graphic designer, and I'm actually trying to combine those two in content strategy. Great. Yep. I think that makes sense. Um, yeah, and then, you know, like I keep saying, those are the inputs, and I think you can find a problem where those inputs are part of solving the problem and then just, you know, talk about the problem. Um, here's the other thing is uh, when your position correlates with a, a real problem that people have, uh, you're going to be so surprised to hear this. People who are in pain love talking about their pain with someone that they think can help. So if you start talking in, in any way, either, you know, e cold emailing people or reaching out and asking people to do a brief interview with you and you're like, you know, I'd like to learn more about whatever the problem is and your business. And that's how you approach them. And they're very open to talking to you. You have chosen a position that they care about and, and that's the first step is, I mean, it's so much easier to sell water to people in a desert than it is to uh, whatever. I, I don't know how that analogy goes, but you know what I mean, right? It's yeah. much easier to sell them something they already know they need rather than try to educate them about why they need this thing that they don't know they need. So if your position matches up with that red circle in my diagram, they will be, you'll be surprised at how open they are to talking about you. Talk, not talking about you, talking with you uh, about their problem. So that's something I would look for. Um, the other thing is that people refer you just after they hear what you do. So if you have chosen a position that is uh, specific and memorable, then you'll be, people will say, hey, uh, Tracy, what do you do? And you'll answer with some version of like a positioning statement. And they will say, you know what? I... I need, uh, I know somebody who needs that or uh, I need that or, or whatever. I actually, I had a client who did a strategy call with me and he tested different positioning statements by going to meetups um, and just trying them out. So he would meet people for the first time. He'd go to a meetup where he thought the kind of people who would be his clients would be. And they would say, so uh, blah, 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 what do you do? And he would answer with, you know, he would like A, B test different positioning statements against each other. And he would just look in their eyes at their reaction and they would kind of light up when he said one that really connected with them. And other times he said he would, he would try a positioning statement and it just, it didn't fit or they didn't really believe that he could do what he said he was doing. And uh, he could see it immediately in their reaction. 
uh, their eyes glazed over, that sort of thing. Exactly. So that's another way you can try testing it. Um, I don't get out much. I'm not a not an extrovert. I'm an introvert, so I don't. I haven't tried that myself, but uh, that might be a way you might try, depending on your personality. Yeah, I mean, my I feel like my positioning has to be absolutely on point because. Um, I live outside of the major markets. I've mm-hmm. actually got a question about this below as well. Um, and it feels to me like um, it has to be spot on to convince people to hire me, to work mm-hmm. with me from a long distance. Probably, but uh, don't put so, don't feel like it has to be that way on the first try. Give yourself permission to uh, you know iterate and try several variations don't uh don't put that pressure on yourself of like well i can't do this unless it's perfect i don't know if you're a perfectionist at all like me but yes. just uh <laughs> yeah so just tell yourself give yourself permission to experiment a little bit with it and iterate on it i think that will help you um start to get more feedback so that you can then um have that feedback available to you know refine it over time but you're right. Yeah. The the more spot on it is, the stronger response you'll get. And um, I, I, I totally understand what it's like to sort of be outside a major metro area and feel like uh, like you're sort of cut off a little bit, <laughs> except for the online channel. Any other questions I can answer for you or you want to discuss that a little more? Um, it, well, I, I guess one of the barriers I've come up against, and I've been freelancing for over 10 years, mm-hmm. um, is that I, I, I live in Tasmania and, okay. and um, I've met people and they've, they've been interested in what I do. Um, mm-hmm. And then I mentioned that I'm in Tasmania and I, and I get the response, not always, but I get the response, um, why would we work with someone who's in Tasmania? Are, is there any kind of like... Uh you know, sort of cultural or, or there is know, a social bit. bias against? Yeah, okay. there is a little bit. It's, it's, I don't know, I don't really know what the US equivalent is, but I know that in Canada, for example, it's it's like working with someone who's in Newfoundland. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yep. And there, you know, there, there are very, there are, there's, there's one very successful designer that I'm aware of who is in somewhere like Newfoundland um, and has managed to overcome that barrier. Yeah. Um, and so that that's what I'm trying to do as well is is have enough credibility and enough clout um, and, and and enough um, uh, you know of an answer to, to businesses' pain points like you said that uh, it overcomes that it uh, that objection will go away when when you have the you understand what you need and it, again I, I promise you when you when you get that narrow focus, you'll build up the the credibility very quickly and people will, they'll stop saying that to you because they won't want to offend you because you're the person that they need for this thing. Um, so that will go away. I, I'm sympathetic. I, I lived in a rural area for a while and um, I kind of felt like apologetic about it, um, but it'll go away. And then you'll just tell them how beautiful it is there and they should come visit sometime. <laughs> Which is very true. Um, I'm really appreciating the the comments and getting in the sidebar from people as well. They're great. Cool. Cool. Okay. Well, uh, I think we may have time for one more question. Anthony, uh, you're up next. Uh, Tracy, it was wonderful to meet you. you and too. I'm, I'm going to move on to the next question here. You can hang up whenever you're ready. I don't know okay. how to do that. Um, I don't either. There's probably a button if you float over your Oh, here your we go. Right. Yeah. All right, Anthony, um, pop on the screen if you can. Uh, here's the question. I've got three expensive problems for exactly the same audience. One is potentially super expensive. And I know from some communication with Anthony, that when he says computer, he means uh, a main, basically a mainframe computer. Um, but it's not urgent. The other one is more uh, where they see the value, but maybe the price is not there. And Anthony, welcome. Nice to meet you. Uh, I can... Yes. Yes. Okay. First, uh, hi to everybody, especially to Tracy in Tasmania. I, <laughs> I, I t- totally understand her frustration, uh, even though I'm in Sydney. So um, yeah. uh, 
Yeah, and it was just occurring to me, you know, what a crazy, crazy attitude it would be to say, well, look, I'm not going to work with her. However brilliant, however brilliant her work is as graphic design and strategy, I'm not going to work with her because she's in a different part of the country and most of the work is online anyway. Yeah. I mean, look at what we're doing right now. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay, okay so, so why don't you give me a little more detail on, on your question? Yeah. Okay, so I have um, I have been working as a freelancer uh, mainly through agencies for maybe about five seven years. Uh, I have a, um, a a a business where I'm servicing yeah look in your terms mainframe computers, mm-hmm. um, and uh, so so really the bigger end it's not your laptops it's it's for bigger bigger companies uh, big banks or, or or smaller companies and that big retailers manufacturing. So I don't actually have a market in terms of I work through with this industry. It's, the, the one common thread is they all have this brand of computer and they are very, very uh, dependent on it for their business. Okay? Mm-hmm. And so uh, I'm, I'm very well known in, in Sydney and online because of my particular narrow skill set in a pretty narrow market. Mm-hmm. Uh, and because I'm a, a, I write a lot for different magazines, is IBM Computers, by the way. Yep. And so my struggle is that uh, I, I can identify an expensive problem. What happens if your computer goes down? Mm-hmm. Uh, what's going to happen to your business? Let me walk you through the business pain. Forget about the technology. Let's walk through what's going to happen to your stores, to your 2,000 staff, to your warehouse, to your deliveries, orders. Let's walk through that pain, mm-hmm. okay? And, and I can, and and I, I can really make them recognise that pain. But it's still, still, I sort of say, well, why should we be paying this guy? Uh, it's really an insurance policy. Mm-hmm. Um, well, what are we actually getting from it? Okay. And why are we paying paying this check each month? Uh, as, as a different area is that I can do incremental improvements on things which will affect users, which will bring out sales reports faster or or uh, things that I can translate for the business in, into business value. Um, and that's more concrete. It's more tangible, the result. It's not just, that, well, this could happen. You know, our computer may, may get hit by an asteroid, uh, but it's something more yeah. concrete. Um and I, I suppose the thing is that even though I've got exactly the same customer base on exactly the same technology, it's not like I'm going to do WordPress websites and and this uh, very geeky kind of technology. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I'm still finding it that it, it's I'm still chasing two rabbits and okay. catching neither, neither one. Okay. Where should I put? I have a thought for you. <clears throat> yes. Um, so it's, it seems very uh, clear to me that the, you know, the problem that is the really expensive one is a, a sale that can, is much more easily made when you have a relationship with the client. Yes. So here's what I would encourage you to consider is, um, so they see, th- they need some education to see the value in, um, in the, uh, I mean, what would you call that? Like a disaster recovery prep yeah, or something yeah. like that. Yeah. Example, so yeah. we need some education to see that they need, and they probably need repetition from you. Right. Like they need contact with you and they need to hear you saying, Oh, wow. Uh, I just came from this other client and they just, their system sure. went down for six hours and they told me it cost them this much money. Yes. And it just blew me away. They yes. need to hear that from you, the guy they already like and trust, yes. who, who's been in there doing something for them. And yes. I think that's your best chance of making that sale. In internet marketing, uh, they call that a back-end sale. To, so it's a sale to someone who's already a customer. They, so it's on the back end of the first transaction. That's why they call it that. And that strikes yes. me as a back-end sale. Um, and... That's so. I would not try to position yourself around that. I would not put your, you know, six. That would not be your six-second elevator pitch. The six no. six-second elevator pitch is on yeah. the um, that that day-to-day incremental thing where they see value, and 
you are very consciously trying to sell the thing they see value in and then on the back end you're trying to sell other services after they have established trust in you right in, in fact um because of my particular niche i and because i've been white labeling myself through a number of different agencies mm -hmm. i tend to tend to know pretty much all of these uh, sites in sydney uh -huh. and for many of them i've worked on them and i i think i, I build trust very quickly mm -hmm. so it's not a question of chasing the clients online or um uh, 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 even though I'm trying to do that, I, I, it's not very likely that somebody's going to contact me uh, that way. Yes. It's usually going to be through an agency or through an existing contact. It's not very likely to be at a at a, at a trade conference or, or 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 people just doing a Google Google search. Although if right. they do that, they will find me anyway. Mm. Yes, yeah. that's the advantage of uh, being focused. Is uh, you. It's very good for your Google rankings, at least for specific searches <laughs> for what you do. Yeah, thank you. Okay, okay. thank you very much, uh, Philip. And thanks for all of your other advice. I just keep sending traffic to Philip Morgan. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate and I tell it. People, I tell people if they haven't read the manual and if they can't afford the positioning manual, then it's a sign that they especially need to buy it. <laughs> yeah, that's straight, straight out of Alan Weiss's playbook. Uh, Oh, I'm you can't afford too. me? That's, that's exactly why we need to work together. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm reading that book at the moment, The Value uh, uh, value Added Values. Fees. Yeah, the great. Well, fees, yeah. Anthony, thank you for thank your you. question. You're very welcome. Um, and thank you all for your questions. I hope that this was as interesting for you as it was for me. Um, I'm definitely going to be doing this again. I was kind of not sure how the... Uh, how the interaction would go, but I feel like Crowdcast handled this flawlessly, at least on my end. And uh, and if you want to show up to the next one, uh, I'll be here uh, probably in two or three weeks. I'll do another one on a different topic. Not sure what yet, but check your email for that. So thanks, everybody. I'm going to um, click stop broadcast, which is going to kind of hang up the phone on all of you. And I hope if you have follow up questions, you'll just uh, drop me a line via email. And uh, if there's any other particularly interesting questions in here and I have the time, I'll answer them uh, via text here in the, uh, the question list. So thanks again and see you all soon. Bye. Thank you.